Good morning, everyone. Nothing like talking about poo first thing on a Monday morning. <laughs> I'm a nurse and it's my favourite topic. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Okay. You can all see that okay, everybody? So as you know, I'm Rachel, the clinical nurse lead here with Parkinson's New South Wales, and it's nice to see a few of my, my former um, acquaintances from Port Macquarie on the, on the Zoom this morning. So we're going to talk about constipation and Parkinson's. Um, so we're going to ask what is constipation, why does it occur in Parkinson's, and why is it important not to be constipated, and what can you do to ensure that you have a daily bowel motion? And at the end, we'll have some questions and answers. Is that all right with everybody? Good. Okay. Oops. Oh. Okay. So... Back to the back to our wonderful Parkinson's iceberg, you know, all the things that we know about Parkinson's that we can see. And it's really interesting, isn't it, that one of the non-motor symptoms is constipation. It's right up the very top. And when I speak to lots of patients, they often tell me about their constipation and how, how it affects them and, and how it's a problem. And it's probably a very non-motor, it's really problem, troublesome non-motor symptom. And I get very excited when people tell me that, that, that it's not one of their symptoms. So let's talk about constipation. What is constipation? Um, I'll talk a bit more a bit in, in, in the in ahead but um there's a bit of disparity about what people constitute as constipation but i'll just say now it's a diminished frequency in your bowel movements and that's fewer than two to three bowel movements per week and they usually hard stools stools means poo abdominal pain and bloating and some straining upon when you're actually defecating or trying to do the poo In Parkinson's, we say it's a very common non-motor symptom. Um, some people say that it's the most pro prominent and disabled, disabling manifestation of um, your GI uh, dysfunction. And when you look at all the studies in the databases, they range from the occurrence or the prevalence being anywhere from 24.6 to 63%. Although I have seen some studies that suggest that up to 80% of people um, have um, constipation. And some of those disparities in the statistics might be to do with the diagnostic criteria. So if someone says it's constipation is, um, you know, not a daily bowel motion, but every second daily, that may change those stats. We also know that it definitely can precede the diagnosis of Parkinson's for up to 20 years. And when I was in Port Macquarie, I spoke to one man and he told me that he was sure that he was born with constipation. And, this, and we'll talk a bit more about this, how this happens. The risk of constipation, so we know it's a prodromal, it can happen up to 20 years before someone gets diagnosed, but we also know that the risk increases with age and a longer disease duration. Um, the more severe motor symptoms can also increase your risk of constipation. Um, polypharmacy, so we talk, when we're talking about people who are on lots of different medications, um, they can also increase their risk um, and a higher number of comorbidities. And, you know, one of the big things is also is reduced physical mobility. So that makes sense too, doesn't it? If people's um, mobility is slowed down because of Parkinson's, um, that can increase their risk of um, constipation. And why does it occur? Uh, we go back through the, to the databases. Why does constipation occur in Parkinson's disease? Well, some very clever people say, like they do with Parkinson's, it's multifactorial. There's lots of different reasons why it may occur. One, one reason we know about is to do with our autonomic nervous system. So if you, if you know about your autonomic nervous system, know that you don't have to think about taking a breath or you don't think about having to regulate your blood pressure and you don't think you have to remember or to instigate your digestion. So the autonomic nervous system regulates the function of that smooth muscle in the gastrointestinal tract. So in Parkinson's, there's a dysregulation of that smooth muscle. And we also, we also consider about the, the loss of those dopamine neurons in the enteric. Enteric means gut nervous system. 
And also, um, we also discuss a lot about um, this alpha nuclear misfolding pro protein. So in Parkinson's, or actually in every all of us, we have a protein called alpha synuclein. And for some reason, it can it misfolds and aggregates. We call them the Lewy body aggregates, and that can be through the enteric nervous system as well, um, and also changes the gut bacteria. So there's a lot of research done about microbiomes in the gut, and all these things are the multifactorial reasons why people have a greater risk of constipation in Parkinson's disease. Um, I, I tell people when, I, when I'm doing education with them that the gastrointestinal tract is one very long muscle. It starts with, you know, from your mouth and all the way down to your rectum. I um, mean, in the mouth, um, we have issues around saliva when people are actually not producing more saliva, but they're actually not able to swallow. Um, salivary glands can also produce problems with um, low production and, and, and issues around swallowing with frequent drooling as well. Um, in the esophagus, we esophagus. Sorry, we know that a lot of people can suffer from swallowing um, difficulties, um, and, and then we go down into the stomach, where there's a, um, in people generally there's a lot of what we call erratic or impaired gastric emptying, or the other word for that is gastroparesis, so slowing down. And we know in Parkinson's patient that that emptying of gastric it becomes very erratic. And then in the small intestine, there's issues around the colon, which um, I tell people if I have a colonic transit time of, of, say, after I digest a meal, it may be much faster than someone with Parkinson's, so that fecal matter goes through faster with me um, because I don't have the diagnosis of Parkinson's, so it's the dysmotility. Um, and then sometimes there's also issues with actually defecating. And the gastrointestinal tract is a very long tract, isn't it? If you stretch it out, it's very long. So, so issues about gastric emptying we've known for some time. Um, so, which slows down um, this colonic transit time. And there's been lots of studies around that as well. Um, and how that affects drug absorption of your Parkinson's medications too. So we, need, we know we need dopamine for body muscle movement. So the bowel muscles become slow and rigid. Um, they can become weak and unable to contract. And again, the muscles may clench when you're trying to relax your sphincter and you're sitting on the toilet and you're finally trying to do your poo. Um, we talked about slow colonic transit time. So... The slower the transit time of, of the fecal matter, the more the water gets absorbed from the waste products in your, in your gut. And that means that the poos or the stools become harder and they're more difficult to pass. It's all pretty straightforward, isn't it? How it doesn't work and how it does work. Other causes, we always blame anti-Parkinson's medications for many things, but they also um, there is also a role that they can contribute to your risk of constipation. Um, uh, if you look up the databases, Artane, which is often used for tremor, is one culprit that is known to contribute to constipation. Um, if people are taking antacids because they have gast gastric reflux, that can certainly um, contribute to constipation. And we all know, regardless of Parkinson's disease, that anybody on opiates um, can have con increased constipation. So your oxycontins, endones, codeine, um, you know, panadine fort, um, they, are, they are culprits when it comes to increasing your risk of constipation. When you're not moving around as much because of your Parkinson's, that can create an in increased risk of constipation and an insufficient fluid intake. So you can imagine as that, as that stool's passing through and water's being absorbed off and you're still not drinking enough, then that's going to make those, um, that stool even harder. Um, a lower fibre intake. It was really interesting when I was working up in Port Macquarie, I spoke a lot to the continents C and C then, and she was telling even with, um, you know, with toileting habits, particularly she was talking about young children, about everyone's on the rush these days, so no one actually really gets to sit down on the toot and sit there for as long as they need to, and also ignoring those urges um, because they're busy doing other things. So 
really, you know, you need, if you get the urge, um, there's some great words out there you can look up to, peristalsis and tenesmus. Um, when you get those feelings, you need to go to the toilet and take your time. So the symptoms are of constipation, just difficulty passing the motions or poo, feeling the need to strain, and we said fewer than three bowel motions on a week on average. And then there's also a feeling that the bowel isn't empty, even after, even after going to the toilet. So you still feel that there may be something there. Um, if you've been into hospital and or you've had anything to do with any nurses, you know that we love the Bristol Stools Chart. Okay, it was developed in, in the UK in 1997 and it gave, it gave us a way of, of nurses and patients to communicate the types of stool and, and that sort of gave us um, some good information about gut health too. So it's type one to type seven. My, one of my, my girlfriends used to work up on the um, gastrointestinal ward and every nurses, International Nurses Day, she used to make cakes in the shape of the Bristol stool chart. So um, we always, we never stopped us eating them. So you can see type one, and I'll talk a bit more. These are the ones, the separate hard lumps, they look like little pellets. And then there's also the type two, the sausage shaped, but they're lumpy, they're all clumped together. What we really want people is to have these type three and type four. So they look like a, like a sausage when you, when you do them with some little cracks, or they've got this sort of smooth snake-like look. When you're getting down to the type fives, six and sevens, they're getting a bit watery and we'd be concerned about that. So, and we can talk about that too, but what we really want you to do is to aim for a daily bowel motion and looking like a type three or type four. So I think we've, we've mentioned this, so the, the, the dry hard bowel motions, the type ones and the twos, they're ones that you don't want to do. Oops, sorry, I was told not to show that. <laughs> um, it, was this, it was a picture I kept hassling this gentleman about what his poo looked like, because often people say they did a big poo and I'd say, are you sure it was a big poo? And we'd argue about how big was big. And anyway, he, he shut me up one day by actually going and doing a poo and um, taking a photograph of sending it to me. So I did shut up after that. I never hassled him ever again. Another gentleman actually bought his poo in, in, in a Tupperware container and it was the biggest poo I've ever seen. So I never hassled him ever again too about what he considered to be a Bristol three and four. Okay, so the big risks of constipation, if you have Parkinson's, your symptoms may not be managed as well if you are constipated. And that's because your Parkinson's medications are absorbed in the, in this, in the small intestine, that's where they're best absorbed. And if you are fecally loaded, you, you, it doesn't work as well. When we talk to people about park with about constipation and they say or about their symptoms, they say, my symptoms are getting worse. And the first thing you know, if you ring up Kathy or I or you speak to any of the Parkinson's nurses, we'll ask you about your bowels. And we know that if you do get on top of um, of constipation, that people do ring back and say, Wow, that does make a difference. Okay. Not only does it affect the absorption of your medication, it does make you feel uncomfortable and bloated. Um, one of the neurologists that I speak to believes that people with Parkinson's are far more bloated than they, they realise. Um, when you're bloated like that, you get nauseous, you don't have an appetite, you get lethargic and that, you know, reduces your exercise um, motivation. And the worst thing I've seen is people who present to ED in the hospitals with a small bowel obstruction because they've been um, constipated and the constipation has actually caused this bowel obstruction or a volvulus. And one man had to have, end up having, <coughs> having a colostomy bag. So if that doesn't put the fear of um, getting on top of constipation into you, don't know what else will. Um, so it, it, the impacts of constipation, they do have detrimental impacts on people's quality of life and on their activities. And, in, and it's, um, there's a relationship between increasing psychological and social distress when you're constipated. It's just interesting, isn't it? You think that the brain rules the, the body, but you know what it really does, don't we? If you are constipated too, um, it can also affect your bladder. 
So if you've got a full rectum, it actually places pressure on your bladder. If you've ever been in hospital and um, you've had a, had a catheter in, you'll know the nurses will never remove the catheter until you've had your bowels open. So, so it, there's a mechanism there. Um, when your bladder is, when your rectum is full, it prevents your bladder from completely emptying. And then that, that retention of urine can increase your risk of urinary tract inf in, um, infections. And also, um, when people have a, a full rectum and anus, they can, it actually stimulates the bladder. So it can cause more urgency and frequency. Another good reason to get on top of constipation. So managing constipation. So um, one of the neurologists who works at Westmead, he tells patients with Parkinson's to aim for two daily bowel motions. And some people tell me, I would rather climb to the top of Mount Everest. It's just so hard to do two. If you can do it one aim for a daily bowel motion, that's great. Um, keep a bowel diary. So I keep talking to people and I go, when did you have your bowels open last? Mm, not sure. What did it look like? Mm, not sure. I know it sounds a bit um, weird, but it's good to have, you know, to keep a, a good diary of your gut health. Eat well, a, a diet rich in dietary fiber. You've got to drink fluids, otherwise this stool stays and gets hardened. It's really important to exercise regularly, um, not just for, um, for all the other good reasons for Parkinson's and sort of some sort of capacity disease modifying, but it's, you know, it's good for bowels as well. And to practice good toilet habits. Can you see, can you see this person sitting here? Whoever invented the toilet throne um, has a lot to answer for in terms of constipation because what it actually does is bend um, this area here and it makes it more difficult. When you sit forward and you've got your knees up and you're squatting with your elbows on your knees, it actually elongates that um, rectum anus. It makes it easier to defecate. Um, if you need to get get a dietitian to make sure that you're on a good diet of high fibrous foods and that you're getting adequate fluid intake and we talk about fibrous pears split peas bran and broccoli um, one patient told me eating sultanas would gave them great relief for constipation but difficult to swallow so you might need to see a speech therapist to make sure that the um, issues of chewing and swallowing are also addressed I've, uh, I've gone through a list of the pharmacological agents if you need to progress onto those for Parkinson's. Um, the, the data from the MDS, um, which was uh, 2018 by CEPI et al, recommends um, probiotics and osmotic laxatives. And I've actually, so I've gone through these in detail. Um, another neurologist used to say to patients, which I thought was very clever was, come rain, hail or sunshine. So people would tell me that they took them, they took Movacol, they had their bowels open and now they didn't need to take it anymore. But if you go back to the mechanism and you know that it, you know, it's this autonomic dysfunction that slows down the gut, I think you probably need to take um, um, appearance just like you need to take your Parkinson's medications. Um, another objection was that people said, well, I took Movacol and then I had the worst diarrhea ever. Um, I would say, please don't be confused about what happens when you are fecally loaded, when you're full of SHIT, and then you take Movacol and it causes, the water has to come somewhere. So the pharmacological in the other section, they reckon, rec uh, recommend um, um, psyllium or psyllium husks, which you can find in Metamucil, and you can also find them in um, other sources of food that you can add to food. Um, the side effects of those often is a feeling of being bloated. Um, definitely probiotics and prebiotics are on the, on the uh, cards for Parkinson's disease, and they help, they're meant to help with the frequency of your bowel movements. Um, I keep going back into the like chemist warehouse or into the databases to see how I can map out what the recommendations are against the products that are available um, and still haven't quite worked them out. But I think if you spoke to your pharmacist um, or a dietitian, they'd be able to help you work out which are the suitable um, probiotics and prebiotics for you with the, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but um, I also know that they're quite expensive as well, some of these products too. 
Um, Mover Coal, I should have bought shares in Mover Coal when I started to be a Parkinson's nurse many years ago. Okay, so it's an osmotic agent. What it does is it brings water to that hard, dry stool and it acts locally in the colon. So what it does is it, it expands the stool and triggers this clonic activity to make you actually do a poo. So essentially it rehydrates and softens the stool um, and it also preserves electrolytes. So um, if you take some of the stimulant laxatives, it can actually cause lots of diarrhea and you lose a little bit of electrolytes. If you don't like Muvacol, then we recommend Osmolax. It's also an osmotic agent. It rehydrates and softens, and you can add it to things like drinks and yogurts. And when we talk to take these, these agents, make sure that you drink the fluids as well. The stimulant laxatives, um, what the way they act is by inducing bowel movements, by increasing the contractions of those intestinal muscles. So you can imagine if you overdose on those, you're going to get a big stomach ache. Um, there's lots of concerns that long-term use and overuse can cause nerve damage and colon dilatation, or they call it a, like a paralytic ileus. Um, there's a bit of a myth buster perhaps about that. Um, the, there's a bit more data as well that they're not sure, but um, you know, we definitely use things like um, Senecot or um, Coloxalin Senna in periods when people are really, really badly constipated. Um, probably using the Muvacom, the probiotics are better long term. And believe it or not, some people need to actually have Botox. And as we know, Botox is a fairly short acting, but it's um, it can be used for it helps this pubo rectalis muscle to relax um, so that you can actually defecate that's for, in terms of constipation but you know that we can also use it for people with an overactive bladder or the the dribbling the sialuria and they usually put it into the parotid and sub and mandibular glands okay so i'd also say check out continents australia they've got some great resources too and um and never forget to mention about the Continence AIDS program or CAPS where you can, if you need any Continence AIDS, you can, um, I think you can receive up to about $500 a year into your bank account. Um, that's a very nice gesture. And believe it or not, during lockdown, um, all the through London, they actually had the Bristol stool chart. And they had this massive fascination. It was called going through the motions, the rise and rise of stool gazing. So we're not, so Parkinson's nurses are not the only weird people when it comes to um, constipation and poo. You can you imagine seeing that on the bus shelter? And if you're really, really keen, I'm not quite sure where they're up to, but um, um, there was a, an app that you could put onto your phone with your email address and you could take a photo of your poo and send it off to seed.com. And then they would tell you the type of poo that you had done and to see what your gut health status was like. So I'm not sure if that's still um, still happening. I remember I remember people talking about it at the time and that, you know how weird it would be to take a photograph of your poo. But anyway, they said it was the world's first and largest poop in image databases. And there's my references.